Well, updates for two weeks in a row. Hell must have frozen over. Which means it'll be a nice pleasant climate for playing more Hell. It's a fairly nice day out, and uh, my chestular region is mostly not purple anymore. Still a little bit purple. But uh, I'm feeling good, so we're, uh, we're gonna keep this train a-rolling. Anyway, last time on I Played a Thing, Hell, a cyberpunk thriller, we gave Cyborg Grace Jones a hummer, and got in all friendly-like with Alda Xenon over here, which means that we are invited to meet Senator Burr at the British Embassy and formally join up with the Citizens' Freedom Front. However, we're not going to do that right away. What we are going to do instead is uh, kick off a massive text dump. Actually, this whole game is kind of a massive text dump, but today it'll be a little different because instead of being partialed, uh, parceled out over various characters, we're all going to get it from one big source. And if we get done with that in a decent amount of time, then perhaps we will be able to do some side quests as well. So let's head on over to the DC map. You may recall when we were talking to our cop buddy Frank Jersey at the beginning of the game, he mentioned a uh, transgressions official named Jean San Mouchois, and we are going to uh, investigate the diaries of Mr. St. Ch uh, Snotrag. And he has got a lot of information in his computer. And that's where our big text dump is coming from. But on the bright side, Jean San Mouchois is portrayed by Jeffrey Holder, which means we're going to uh, be getting this massive text dump in his pleasant voice and occasionally wacky accent. It's just a locked door, but nobody knows how to lock a door like a government security agent. I'll be the judge of that. Damn, it's locked. Damn, it's locked. Damn, it's locked. Damn, it's locked. I don't know where you think you're going, Rachel. Damn, it's locked. Anyway, uh, I think we can, uh, pretty much, uh, definitively say the door is locked. But, uh, we do have a lockpick. Hopefully Dr. Clean does good work. This implant is permanently attached. Oh, he thinks I'm trying to put it down. Wrong button. That worked. Thank you, Rachel. Gideon, go in the door. Okay, maybe I have to move Rachel out of the way. Let's try that again. Much better. The hush of privacy clings to this room, as if the dedicated occupant has worked there, sweated there, worried there for a long time. There's the couch, the worn leather chair. Even the computer seems to have taken on his personality. I like the giant globe. Well, let's go over and check out uh, Mr. Snotrag's computer. Access code, eh? Well, this always works. But what have we here on the desk? Ho ho! And over here? A standard number two pencil. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. All 
right, we'll just pocket that. And if we were to use said uh, standard number two pencil on the scratch pad here, we're going to do this all detective style. Hopefully not get a Jackie Treehorn boner picture. Ah, that's much m Ah, I can't talk today. That's much more useful. You know, Jean, that's a decent password. You know, multiple words and uh, punctuation and all that. But, you know, you ruin the whole thing when you just write it down next to you, uh, to your computer, on a notepad. Ah, well, his ignorance of best practices is our gain. So you see here, we've got uh, quite a few things to look through, and that is why this is going to be such a big info dump. Let's begin with demons. Oh, and it's got a sub-menu. Well, we might as well begin at the beginning with the Unholy Trinity. The Holy Trio. Belial, Beelzebub, and Mephistopheles. The demons continue to trouble me, especially the unholy triumvirate, Bilal, Beelzebub, and Mephistopheles. I realize, of course, that the hand cannot eradicate supernatural immortal beings. They are all a part of God's plan. The plan that Solocks enact here on Earth. So according to the Imperator's direction, we condemn people to serve under these hell laws. We send them to their lairs to serve their sentence. Well, we heard a little earlier about uh, Belial and Mephistopheles, those being the demons that uh, Sanguinarius and Mr. Beautiful serve under. And we've apparently got one more big boss of the underworld, that being Beelzebub. Good to know. Speaking of Mr. Beautiful, that would be Pazuzu, and apparently uh, Asmodeus is another significant figure related to him. Let's find out more about that. Pazuzu and Asmodeus, I made a run with a squad of rookies today, and we caught a blatant sinner, a man who has been haunting the Ford Theater area, exhibiting himself. We had to let him go. Seems he worked for Asmodeus. We are never supposed to prosecute people involved with the Hell Syndicate. Asmodeus, the demon filmmaker. Or Pazuzu, a.k.a. Mr. Beautiful, gambler, drug dealer, wise guy. Don't know why we can't prosecute these guys. Besides the fact that they are actually demons, and we probably can't catch them if we wanted to. They must fit into the plan somehow. Hmm, interesting. Transgressions is not supposed to bust anyone involved with Asmodeus or Mr. Beautiful, members, as he puts it, of the Hell Syndicate. Which makes me kind of wonder why, if we're supposed to be linked to Mr. Beautiful, that they were able to send a scrub team after us. I guess we're just special. And a bit more data on Mr. Beautiful himself. Mr. Beautiful. Captain Thorne decided to use Beautiful to complete the case we were building against the Smoke Cowboys, a gang of technology outlaws. I had a scrub team arrest the Cowboys. We charged them with violating the artificial realities ban. And Beautiful supplied the judge with all the evidence we needed to send the cowboys to Belial's pits. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that was enlightening. How about Dean Sterling? That's a name we've heard before. Dean Sterling. Some of the men are suspicious about a freelance demon hunter we are monitoring. His name is Dean Sterling. 
he's been having some real success. He eliminated a score of minor and mid-level demons. And now, we hear he's after the big ones. Asmodeus, beautiful, any of them that are brazen enough to walk the earth. It is understood in the department that some of the demons are untouchable, but Sterling has the freedom to choose his target at will. As for me, I will neither hinder or assist Mr. Sterling. He has made his presence felt, and the demons are nervous about him. As far as I am concerned, he is a genuine good guy. Interesting. A demon hunter. Well, that must take some brass balls. And uh, he's not officially a part of the hand. He's a freelance demon hunter, as Mushwa put it. So, uh, he can go after anyone without uh, departmental restrictions. Makes me wonder if that ever puts him in any kind of conflict with the hand, although Jean here seems to think highly of him. And the Citizens' Freedom Front. One of the major thorns in the side of the hand government, and one that we've been recently invited to join. Aha! Apparently there's a separate password on this part of the system. Note, password codes based on combinations of two words with first two letters of each word deleted. Access blah blah blah. So, uh... Each of these sub-passwords is a little puzzle, and uh, Mushua's computer helpfully tells us exactly how to solve them. The first two letters of each word, and this is a two-word code, have been obscured. So we have G-G-Y-K-T-O-M. Well, that's just referring to a part of Washington, D.C., that being... Foggy Bottom. And we've got here Senator Aaron Burr. Yes, that's right, the leader of the CFF, Senator Burr, who uh, we were referred to by Alda Xenon. Her first name is Aaron. Aaron fucking Burr. This game and its names. Well, let's find out about her. Senator Aaron Burr. <laughs> I just received this month's collection of Senator Burr's sighting from our agents in the field. Amazing woman. <laughs> Amazing woman, this Burr. She's seemingly several places at once. Of course we know she's inside the British Embassy here in Washington, where she has been granted political refuge. But we have discovered that there are ways in and out of the embassy. And on several occasions, Burr has escaped the embassy, thus feeding the paranoia among ARC agents that she is everywhere. <laughs> well, I suppose it stands to reason that the leader of the Citizens' Freedom Front would be a bit of a boogeyman to officials in the hand. Let's find out about the CFF itself. The Citizens' Freedom Front. The recent sweep of the CFF shadow government leaves the so-called Freedom Front effectively crippled. The CFF has been fanatically dedicated to their cause. Our best estimate of their membership is in the thousands, although the leadership proper is small and cohesive. Oh dear. So they've been uh, making some raids on the CFF leadership lately. Some successful raids apparently, and that has left the organization uh, rather weakened. And a little history. CFF history. What we know about the CFF is extensive, but not particularly useful. They were founded after the Imperator's ascension by a quartet consisting of a Methodist minister, a Catholic priest, a rabbi, and a Muslim imam. They quickly moved into political activity when they were joined by former government figures, including Urban Burr, who had resigned rather than serve under the hand. 
Indeed, probably not terribly useful information, but it's a little bit of color. Alright, what have we got under government operations? Ah, Knight of Reentombment. That ought to be interesting, because that is the name of the operation in which our assassination was attempted, along with uh, folks like Brian Avery and Swivel O'Leary and so on. But we'll begin at the beginning and check out Knight of the Titans first. Hup. We've got another sub-password, and this one is a little more difficult, just because it's so short and uh, we have very little to go on. So, LLT. The answer to this one is fairly straightforward. It is. Help it. Knight of the Titans. Transgressions recently launched dozens of scrub teams on a coordinated sweep of the CFF Shadow Cabinet. A strike against the resistance that has been over a year in the making. Codename. Knight of the Titans. It's a truly historical occasion. Ah, okay. That must be that sweep that we previously read about in which uh, members of the CFF leadership were apprehended. Oh, and we have a listing of some of them right here. Well, it seems wise to take an opportunity to uh, read up on some of the CFF leadership. Randall Singh, probably the most interesting figure we have named to our sweep operation from a front operative we have been keeping under close observation for a while now. A man named Randall Singh. I'm not certain of his status with the CFF, but we suspected him of being fairly important. Well, that wasn't very informative, but... At least it's someone new we know about. How about Townsend Ellers? Townsend Ellers. The sweep of the CFF Shadow Cabinet also netted Townsend Ellers, a former British ambassador. We believe he has been helping Burr to establish a diplomatic corps in waiting and has been consulting her on world economic matters as well. We suspect he has been a regular conduit between Burr and foreign governments concerning efforts to apply international pressure on the hand. Well, yeah, that would make him pretty important. How about Brett Carew? Brett Carew. Perhaps the only dissident whose apprehension I regretted was Brett Carew's. Carew is one of the three or four writers Solox has banned, and she has been apprehended in the recent CFF sweep. The charges against her are weak, just rumors that she writes some of Senator Byrd's pirate broadcasts. Well, speeches and possibly propaganda are important, so I guess that would make Brett Carew kind of a big deal. But, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Jean here was a fan of her writing. And Eddie Commerce. Eddie Commerce! I confess I do not get the joke. Melissa and I saw Commerce perform years ago when he was legal. I do not find this man to be funny, much less someone capable of being a subversive figure. The filthy language of personal attack against the Imperator. The monologues about free expression. I thought it a mistake to include him in the recent crackdown. Arrests like these only risk making martyrs of people who pose no threat to the hand. Well, I gotta give, uh... San a bit of credit here. He seems to be a somewhat independent thinker. Doesn't consider every bus to be a good one, but well, he does his job. Night of Reentombment. Now this is the operation in which the Hand sent its uh, scrub team against our good friends Rachel and Gideon. 
pretty important stuff. Now this access code is uh, solved with the name of a person we have not yet met. Now there's nothing stopping you from going ahead and entering the code if you already know the name and therefore the answer from a previous playthrough or what have you, but uh, I'm trying to go through this game in a fairly legit sort of uh, order, avoiding any unnecessary sequence breaking, so we're gonna pass on this one for now. So the Knight of Reentombment data remains tantalizingly out of reach. Well, we'll have to console ourselves with some information about some guy named Massimo Eddy. Massimo Eddy. Last night, there was another Massimo Eddy broadcast. Another vision of hell. Massimo is the first man who was damned to hell and lived to tell of his experience. There was Eddy, pain splashed on his face ranting about his trip to hell, bursting into sudden screams of the color, the colors. Then, ooh, fire, all of the flame, all of the flame. Ooh, he would speak and the demons that possesses him would taunt him from within. Ooh, from within a terribly frightening exhibit that reminds viewers what there is to fear about hell. Periodically, the hand drags him out to broadcast his bizarre visions to the nation. He has developed a cult following of people expecting wisdom from the Mad Massimo. I fear those people will be disappointed. I doubt this lost soul has anything to teach. Well, that is an interesting figure. Massimo Eddy, the first man ever condemned to hell under the Hand Regime, and someone who survived his sentence, apparently. And I thought they would be eternal. But anyway, uh, Massimo was apparently driven mad by the experience, and so he makes a good propaganda figure for the Hand, uh, teaching people that hell is something to be very afraid of. Not that that needed a whole lot of reinforcement, but... Yeah, propaganda has its values. And apparently... Massimo Eddy's location is also stored in the computer here. But we need transgressions credentials. And we need an access code to obtain the templates for transgressions credentials. Which would presumably allow our good forger friend, Sophia Bene, to uh, make a fake ID for us. Once again, if we have this access code, there's nothing to stop us from using it early. But again, I'm not going to sequence break here. But I suppose if you're weird enough to want to speedrun hell, that's one way you could shave some time off. And artificial reality containment, our former department. ERC! Reality Containment was outraged after two of its agents were targeted in the latest Scrub Team action. I don't know what the executives in the Five Fingers had in mind when they include Gideon Ashanti and Rachel Brack on the Scrub list. There were ways of making them disappear without setting ARC and transgressions at odds with one another. The question remains, why? What were Ashanti and Brack involved in that demanded that they be eliminated in such a high-profile fashion? Rumors are that the order to kill them came directly from the Imperator. Wow. Well, we may not have been able to find out anything from the uh, Night of Reentombment files, but this seems significant. ARC was a little shaken up by the uh, assassination attempt on Rachel and Gideon, and Jean Saint Mouchois does not even know why our assassination was such a high priority. But apparently it was because uh, Cyborg Grace Jones gave the order herself. Hmm. Oh, incidentally, both uh, Jeffrey Holder and uh, Grace Jones appeared in uh, Boomerang with Eddie Murphy, so uh, this is not the first time they've been on the same project. 
what else have we got here? Okay, that's it for uh, government operations. Well, what about us? Rachel and Gideon have a whole file to themselves. Interesting. Rachel Brack and Gideon Ashanti. Looking through the back files today, I found one I had on Brack and Ashanti. I had forgotten, but I've seen I tried to recruit them myself a couple of years ago when I heard about the great job they were doing at ARC. But to our duel, the scrub team, they were obviously more talented than any of us realized. Their work at ARC was top-notch, even though they had a reputation of going easy on minor criminals. Still, their character was somewhat questionable. Somewhat questionable? I'm insulted. Anyway, nothing much that we uh, didn't already know. We do know that uh, Rachel and Gideon have, uh, you know, let a lot of minor infractions slide, but apparently they were very well regarded agents aside from that. What else have we got here? Fringe operations. A N E R L I N G. Well, this one's not too hard. We've got a fair number of letters to work with, and it involves a person that we just read about. Dean Sterling. Okay, who are the Neo Gnostics? I like the way the uh, Neo gets a G in front of it, just like Gnostics. Very cute. Neo Gnostic. In ancient times, the Gnostics were heretical sects who beliefs were at odds with early Christianity. They believed that human transcendence were directly achievable. The Neos may be just one more group of cyberspace outlaws with designs on founding virtual colonies in the global net. If the latter is true, transgression will scrub them. We may do that in any event if the need for a high-profile but arises. Yeah. So there's some kind of outlaw group, but uh, aside from them being based on the old Gnostic set, we don't really know what exactly it is they do. And they have a headquarters near Capital South. That's good to know. That'll open up a new location on the DC map. And how about the Psionic League? Psionic League. Of the dozens of illegal operations we monitor, the Psionic League is the most dangerous threat to stability, especially if the leader, Columbus Pristola, should ever decide to politicize his organization. The League has been tolerated at this point because it is the inspiration for similar groups. No one better knows the danger of unrestrained psionic ability than Spatola. He's one of the most powerful psionics on the planet. His life is a case study of the hardships that psionics endure when forced to master their abilities alone. His early hardships led to the founding of the League, and his near fanatical belief in the benevolent use of the power. Okay, so uh, Columbus Spatola equals Professor X. Got it. And they're in Georgetown. Another location for us to check out later. Probably quite a bit later because the Psionic League uh, kicks off a subquest which is kind of lengthy and occasionally annoying, and so I'm in no hurry to do, uh, to do that one. Eschatology Incorporated. Eschatology Incorporated. Recent intelligence reveals that Hercule Rudecker and his researchers are no closer to learning any of Hell's essential secrets. Decker serves his purpose. His obsession with Hell, his attempt to map it and to catalog its horror, help to maintain the public sphere. Oh, okay. So these guys are uh, hell researchers, trying to uh, gather hard data about the underworld. 
And this is illegal, but uh, Mushua thinks they're useful. And just like the rest of Fringe Operations, we find out where we can uh, go and see for ourselves. And meets. Meets. Data from reality container shows an increase in illegal attempts to reproduce the human tissue lab of new corporeal biologics. Officially named service units, new corps and famous products are widely referred to as meats. Meats epitomize the relentless perversion of God's creations of human hands. As so with many nightmares, it all started with good intentions. The good of providing silver machines for the masses was lofty and laudable. But when the meats were introduced into the market, the public was outraged. The meats were twisted parodies of humanity, flesh without souls. Within six months, the meats were a moral scandal. When several developed cancer, it was more cost-effective for new corporeal to discard the entire tissue casing than it was to perform surgery. One head group began to burn meats in public. The meats were withdrawn from the market and new corporeals closed. Now outlaw entrepreneurs seek to revive the technology for use in foreign markets. Such criminal efforts are precisely what transgressions and ARC were formed to combat. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, the meats were designed to uh, serve humanity in various ways, uh, officially being called server units, but uh, they were basically uh, automata that uh, were combined with living tissue. I'm not exactly sure what the point of that was, why you would want a robot that had the uh, bonus feature of being able to develop cancer. I'm really just not sure what that was about, but anyway, uh, the public was thoroughly grossed out, and of course, meats are illegal under the hand. And the remains of the laboratory company that uh, was producing the meats back when they were legal and before the public outcry is near Federal Center Southwest. Matter of fact, I think that's the next place we're gonna go. Is that all for Fringe Ops? Yes it is. Hey, let's uh, read a little about the Imperator. We had an inter-office whole conference call from the Imperator today. The Imperator discussed the recent actions against the CFF. Solux pointed out that the CFF was still operating. The sweep had failed to net Aaron Burr, and that an even greater effort must be made. The entire performance was classic Solox. It reminded me of the Imperator's ascension to power, when Solox would inspire tens of thousands of people at mass rallies, saying things that would make the crowd leap to its feet and roar its devotion. When Solox finally ascended to power, it was as if Earth had become a new planet. People were sick of how society had crumbled into a crime-ridden, godless, free-fire zone. The Hand of God proved an apt name because that was the way Sola promised to administrate justice. As if an acted by the Lord himself and it has come to pass. So Cyborg Grace Jones is very charismatic. No great surprise there, I suppose. And finally, the Actodec. You remember the Actodec, it is the uh, virtual reality game console that uh, mutated the children of its users. We had that whole thing with uh, Oscar Drexler and the Freak Beats. And we can check out 
Information on the Actodec itself, for starters. When Parallax Entertainment's breakthrough decking technologies permitted the company to create a home entertainment system that provided a direct interface between the user's nervous system and the machine's software, the result was the Actodec. Actodec programs plunge the users into virtual reality worlds for a price. Anything was possible, but the price proved to be steep. The Parallax ad campaign had claimed that the direct interface between nervous system and circuitry allowed the player to change the machine. What they didn't know or weren't telling was that the machine was changing us. When details of the Parallax effect broke, the public outrage was intense. The issue dovetailed perfectly with the hand of God's plan for seizing power and was a significant tool in their campaign against technology. And I had discussed this previously, but there you have it again. The significance of the Akadek in the ascension of the hand of God and the illegalization of virtual reality. Parallax Code Parallax Code The Parallax Code is a highly secret series of computer code modules that made cyberspace a reality. To my knowledge, the source code for Parallax has never been discovered. Okay, so that's the technology that made the Actodec possible. And uh, apparently the hand has been, uh, excuse me, the hand has been successful in keeping it under wraps, if indeed it's out there to be found at all. And that appears to be everything that we can do with uh, Mushua's computer at the time. We will eventually have to return to ferret out some more information about the Night of Reentombment which presumably uh, includes some pretty important information since we're trying to figure out why we were uh, attacked in our apartment. And chances are we're going to need that information on the location of Massimo Eddy as well. But that's all, and Mushua's computer is the only thing of significance in this uh, location. So we can go ahead and roll on out. And I think we've got enough time to do a little bit of side questing. Now by going through the fringe operations file, we came up with uh, quite a bit of information about new locations of places that uh, were under investigation or shut down by the hand and one of them was New Corporeal Biologics, the now defunct creator of the meats. And this is a good place to start off with our side quests because, well, it's not really a side quest, it's more just a location that we can uh, visit to get some goodies and a little bit of vital information. So let's go ahead and do that. Lots to see here. We'll start with our customary look around. Also known as the meat locker, this is where the flesh, blood, nerves, and muscle tissue was grown for the meat synthetic multi-servers and birthing units. Although these techs have long been outlawed for decades, the fact that there is some fresh growth on the framing units indicates that someone has tried to start things back up. Hmm. So it looks like New Corporeals, judging by, uh, as the description said, the fresh growth on the framing units, uh, looks like uh, someone's trying to get them back in business. And that's this gentleman in the blue over here. That being Ben Brewer. We also have down here uh, Fakun5088, 
which is a conversation that I know GTF has been eagerly awaiting. But for now, let's just start off by uh, grabbing some of the things lying around. I think a couple of these items are red herrings and not all of it is actually useful, but quite a bit of it is important. And we'll check out our new items real quick like. A five gallon can of kerosene. You never know when you might need to set something on fire. This odd steel cup looks like a cyber petri dish. I have no idea what the hell that's supposed to mean, but always good to have a drinking implement around that isn't full of acid. This powerful handheld electromagnet could yank the fillings out of the androgyne at 50 feet. Well, there's something we can try if the uh, Hummer doesn't work out, I suppose. A small version of the basic measuring cup for scientists. A basic scientific beaker, unchanged for centuries. You know what? If I'm not mistaken, I think we might have the makings of a still here. Give Scub the tubing and the beakers. And I think that might be enough to use his jury rigging skill. Yes! Well, we now have the ability to uh, make Langua's dreams come true and further his quest for love. But first, of course, we'll have to talk to uh, the folks here at New Corporeal. And wait a minute. You know, if we look at that uh, Night of Rain Entombment memo, you'll see that uh, New Corporeal Biologics was the employer of one James Henley. So that's someone else that we can uh, ask around about, see if that uh, sheds any light on our situation. Oh, ben Brewer. First off, what does he look like? A man works feverishly amidst the desolation of the long abandoned factory. Fair enough. Shit! You're the heat! I knew it! I'm gonna fry! Oh shit! Look, I'm just a businessman, really. I don't know for morality or ethics. I'm just looking to turn a buck here. Those are some pretty gigantic glasses there, Ben. Don't wet your pants, pal. We're ducking the big heater ourselves. Help us out, and we'll pretend we never saw this place. All right, all right. What do you want to know? And we get a uh, selection of questions to ask. And the first one is pretty much the big one. James Henley. The guy who was scrubbed on the same night the hand came for us. He's the reason I'm so jumpy. What happened to him? I figured the hand's on to us. They got him while he was sitting in the barber's chair. Apparently his wife shrugged it off as God's will. She actually took comfort that he died as part of something big like a scrub cleanup. Well, quite a bit of the dialogue there was uh, not actually voiced. Well, fair enough. If you didn't have enough time there, you can back up and pause it and read the bit about uh, them accidentally executing his barber as well. And that's really kind of messed up about his wife being, uh, you know, such a true believer that she didn't care her husband was killed just because everything the hand does has to be right. No mystery why they wiped him. 
If he was poking through this tissue shop with you, he must have been up to his eyebrows in illegal tech. So you came here. Figured this would be the last place anyone would look for me. I was just trying to score enough to make it overseas. I hooked with Jimmy because he knew the city, because I liked his resume. He'd seen it all, hit it rich, and then lost everything when Mephisto revenged his losses in the commodities market by burning down the Chicago Exchange. Wiped out three quarters of their records and a lot of fortunes that day. Yeah, we heard about it. Jimmy was always vague about his private life. He never wanted to talk about anything that happened more than five or six years ago. It was almost like those parts of his life didn't matter anymore. One time he opened up, told me about a brother of his who was a fighter for the Citizens Freedom Front. Where do we find him? You don't. Apparently he was killed in a CFF action a couple of years ago. That's all Jimmy ever said about it. I could tell. He, he took it hard. He said it was like part of him died when he lost his brother. You say he died two years ago. You're certain he's dead. <laughs> His brother was pretty damn sure about it. Anything else you can tell us about Henley? Anything peculiar? Nothing, other than the fact that he was an outlaw. He did have a strange fixation on a Latin phrase. Um, vocabulum est tabula. Ominous uh, venere abgenitor. Wore a chain around his neck with that phrase on it. I never figured that out. Well, that sounds familiar. You may remember from the intro that uh, Rachel woke up in the uh, middle of her nightmare with a very similar phrase on her voice. And also, Swivel O'Leary also uh, spoke a very similar phrase to himself over and over again. So, uh, we have all these folks who were killed, or almost killed, on the night of re-entombment, all speaking these Latin phrases to themselves, uh, with only a single word difference. Might seem like nothing now, but it could be important later. I think that's a safe bet, Rachel. Yeah, what are you doing here? So what's the scam? Black market for synthetic tissues is booming. All we need are some genetic data on the meat genome, some salvage from this place, and we can begin production of a commercial biomass. You pig. Didn't the meat fiasco mean anything to you? You want to bring that back? No, no, no. We aren't looking to grow meats. Too hard to smuggle on shore. We're looking to fabricate organs for the black market. Artificial skin grafts, that kind of stuff. Well, that actually sounds, uh... Kind of positive. You know, people need organs, and uh, if you can uh, produce them from scratch, great. Of course, uh, James here probably doesn't have the best of uh, motives, just being in it for the money, but still, that's not so bad. Mass produced flesh for an illegal market makes flesh and blood just one more commodity, one more item for sale, one more replaceable product. Well, those transplants have to come from somewhere, Rach. And what is the deal with that meat? She's a beauty, huh? I'm gonna smuggle her to you. There are collectors there that pay me a fortune for her. That's an airmen condition feckin' 8088 birthing unit. A little old, but the tissue's in great shape. They had food stocks and concentrated vitamin compounds stored here. She was able to stay fed through all these years. That turns my stomach. Well, her value is entirely as a museum piece at this point. The gestational chamber, amniotic fluid recycler, fetal perceptual stimulator. You, you can't get parts for this stuff anymore. You're not turning me in, right? You gave me your word you wouldn't turn me in. We gave you nothing. When we've taken care of our own business, we just might be back for you. Hey, cut me a break, guys. I'm just trying to make an almost honest living. Well, that's it for Ben. And now the part uh, GTF has been uh, so eagerly awaiting. 
Let's have a look at uh, old Fagan here before we talk to her. A meat birthing unit patiently waits. You eye the gestational chamber with suspicion. I'm surprised at your revulsion, Rachel. Birthing units like this would have liberated women from childbearing. I am programmed to respond to doubts you may have about the moral dilemmas some find inherent in my existence. That won't be necessary, 5088. I don't think your pre-programmed arguments will persuade us. I am, however, curious about your functions. I am a fecund 5088 birthing unit. I am designed to be a superior gestational unit. The fetal chamber is lined with a biocircuitry interweave to constantly monitor fetal respiration, heartbeat, and important growth factors. Options. Available sensory throughputs to fetus. Soothing sounds and music. Comforting visual displays. Direct projection of parents' voices into fetal chamber. That recordings playable to assist in subliminal environmental orientation. Enough! Oh, God, this is making me sick. I merely recite relevant facts pertaining to childbirth. Simulating the reproductive experience. Not everything can be fabricated in a lab. The existence of this unit proves otherwise. The essentials of the human reproductive events can and have been substantially improved by... Yeah, I think GTF did put it uh, best when he commented on my old screenshot LP of this part. Rachel just got totally shut down and out-argued by a robot uterus. Way to go, Rachel. That's enough, 5088. I'm afraid my partner will pull your plug if you keep it up. And how you feeling, 5088? My self-diagnostic indicates intensive, decade-long neglect to primary mechanical units. You can say that again. The hand put your creators out of business. I'll give them that much. Meats are the hand's rule. Which one's the greater evil? Perverse mockeries of motherhood or tyrants ruling in the name of God? Some choice. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have to give you that one, Gideon. I mean, I'm not really that morally offended by the existence of uh, such creations, 88, er, 5088 here, but, um, yeah, again, I have to wonder what the use of a robot that can get cancer is, and I'm not even sure why a robot gestational chamber needs living tissue or needs to be able to converse and behave in a vaguely human fashion. You know, just, just a box that takes care of the necessities would seem to be enough. Ah well. Anyway, that's all we can do here. But, uh, you know what? Languo needs us. I don't think we can sign off for today without, uh, taking care of our sloth buddy. Let's see, where was Gang Alley? Here we are.
Anglo. Look what we made. Oh, by the way, I never did remember to examine that particular item. Not that it's anything terribly enlightening or interesting, just gotta be thorough. Whoops. A hard to get item in America 2095. A moonshine still. And it does look like a particularly high tech moonshine still. Scub is quite the MacGyver. Anyway, Languo, look what we got. Here's the still, kid. Now, you better give us something on Brian Avery and it better be good. Oh man, this is perfect, man. Barbara's gonna love this, man. As soon as she comes too. Now talk. Sure, man. No problem. What am I talking about? Brian Avery. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, Brian Avery. Yeah, he got killed. I love you, Languo. We know that already. What was he doing around here? He got stuff. In fact, he was supposed to get us a new Holovision. I was all set, man. Put my feet up, had a bag of chips, was just hanging out, getting prepped, resting up. And then I woke up and somebody said he was a goner. A real drag, you know. He was even getting us a set I could use the old remote on and everything. Is that all? Well, I don't know. It might work on other things, but it's really made just for Holovisions, man. I love you, Languo. No, I mean... I mean, do you have any other info? Not really, man. Come on, Rach. I can tell by the smoke coming out of your ears that it's time to go. Hey, thanks for the still, man. Feel free to look around or whatever, wherever you want, man. Well, I think our work is pretty much done for today. We've, uh, gotten the final word on Brian Avery, who we already knew was pretty much irrelevant. And we've fostered the growth of love between a drunk and a stoner. I feel happy with my performance for today. And best of all, best of all, this means we are truly, completely, forever done with Gang Alley. And I think that's something sufficiently celebratory to call it a day on. As always, friends, I am Un, and I thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Take care.